Thank you very much. It's my pleasure and privilege being here today uh, in Vishakapatnam at Geetam and talking to all of you. Uh, excellent speakers, um, and I learned a lot from them. Uh, Nilima, thanks uh, for waking us all up with a passionate talk. And uh, Ramesh, uh, talking about uh, startups, it's always exciting to be part of uh, startups uh, for sure. And uh, Atam Jeet, I want to rename you Passion Jeet. So I'm going to talk about creating a century of Indian innovation. And in my role today, uh, I definitely will play a part in making that happen. I want all of you to be a part in making that happen. But I want to go back quite some time. And uh, you know this, very recently actually, two weeks back, my mom came and uh, gave me two report cards. But this is where we go quite some time back. Those report cards were from my UKG and LKG. Right? <laughs> Kindergarten, but upper kindergarten and lower kindergarten. And um, I saw it, uh, hoping to see some good grades. And I saw Bs. I saw a C. And there was one A. You know, it looks like a sad report card, but actually it's a happy report card. You can make a happy face, you know, B, B, C, <laughs> and an A, right? But the reason I bring this up is that that one A, and it was an A both years, LKG and UKG, it was for working with the hand. Right, so I want to keep that thought with you throughout my presentation. It's about working with the hand. And it's consistent with what all the speakers uh, today uh, talked about. So I'll bring it back again and again and again, working with the hand and action and doing uh, things. And that is going to be the recipe for our success in companies as well as at the national level. What is this? Not bad, not bad. <laughs> so it is not a font error, it is not a missing font. It is actually a Sanskrit uh, shloka uh, from Arya Bhatiya, 500 AD. And uh, this was a time when maybe rest of the world was at war, but we had people in Nalanda sitting and thinking about how do I put a sign table into a shloka? Right? How amazing. Now why would somebody put a sign table into a shloka? Ideas? Anybody? Easy to remember. Any other reason? Intellectual property protection. It is not written down. I will only tell the person who I want to know the sign table in words from. From mouth to ear. Now, it has its advantages, but it has its disadvantages also. So we'll talk about that as well. Now, I want to talk about the hand again. I told you it will keep coming back again and again. That was the story of the mind, a sign table in a shloka. I'll tell you a story, and I'll tell you a few stories as I go along. So it was during the time of the Crusades, 1100, 1200 AD. And this was a battle between Saladin and Richard the Lionheart. Right? So both alpha males, I don't know about gender equality at that point of time, but both were alpha males. And they faced off in the middle of the battlefield. And you know, this is a story. You don't know if this really happened. But apparently, Richard the Lionheart took out his sword and cut through a log of wood to show that he was powerful and his sword was powerful. And Saladin took out his sword, bent it 90 degrees at the hilt, and held it out, tossed up a scarf, a silk scarf. It fell softly on the blade, and it cleaved into two. This was a Damascus sword, as they called it. Even Richard the Lionheart know, knew that it was a better sword. Because a softly falling silk scarf cleaving into two, that is a better sword. This Damascus sword, by the way, was made from a steel known as Wood's steel. Even today, it's called Wood's steel, W-O-O-T-Z. Look it up. It comes from India. It has the pattern that you see on the top left. And it's a very strange pattern. But it had some impurities in the steel, which made it the first carbon steel and only carbon steel anywhere in the world from 500 BC to 1500 AD. We were exporting steel only from India, carbon steel only from India. So we have a reason to be proud of our hands, right? <laughs> so a story much earlier, and this is... Uh, or, uh, yeah, it is a story from much earlier. This is from the uh, Indus Valley times. That dancing girl, I think she has a story to tell. Don't you think? Right? 
I don't know what that story is. I can't share that with you. But I can tell you that it was made probably using the lost wax process. It was one of the first cast bronze ever made. So the earliest forms of metal making were created here in India. And also modern day rocketry. Right? We had a, a speaker Ramesh talk about ISRO. Modern day rocketry goes back to Tipu's rockets. The Chinese, if they were here, they would kill me. <laughs> but I would still say modern day ro rocketry goes to Tipu's rockets because these were the first rockets which carried a payload. Chinese rockets were bamboo rockets. You couldn't pack enough gunpowder in them and uh, make it carry a payload. What was the payload? You see it in that picture. That picture I didn't paint, by the way. I wish I could paint so well. Right? It's a bayonet on a rocket. So it went up, not one, thousands. It went up. And when it came down, the tail would swing and create have a panic in the enemy ranks and would actually cause serious damage by way of the bayonet. How was it possible? Metal working, right? Hands, our people. So things to be proud of. However, there were ages that we missed. We missed the industrial age. We missed the electric age and we missed the digital age. And I'll make a submission that this was because people who worked with their minds never worked with their hands. People who worked with their hands never learned anything in a university. And people who understood the market only did that. They played with the market. And that's not how these ages were created. right? If you look at it, each one of them had a hand, had a mind, and had a market piece to it. And I'll share with you again a story. And I'll let you infer the others. So James Watt invented the steam engine. How many of you will say yes? Many hands, and the longer I hold up my hand, more hands will go up. <laughs> he did not. He uh, made improvements to a Newcomen engine. And even before Newcomen engine, there was a Savary pump, which was using uh, steam. So it was an evolution of technology. Right? In fact, James Watt was asked to repair the Newcomen engine. And he said, why should I repair it? Let me try to improve it. Perfection, just like Atam Singh said, or Passion Singh said. Perfection, and he didn't want to just improve something. He said, I'm given a job. Let me see how best I can do. And he worked on it for one year. Persistence, right? And in this process, he never got the answer of how to improve it until one day, he said, he, the problem was in his mind. But he said, let me take a break. He was walking across a golf green. And that's where the idea came to him, that let me separate out the steam chamber and the condenser. I will not go into the details today, but that improved the efficiency 4x. And that is what allowed the industrial age to happen. Even that wouldn't have got him there. There was a person by name Bolton. He was the last person who was funding him. There were many persons before Bolton who was funding James Watt. Bolton was the very last person. It took a long time and a lot of money uh, to make this happen. Um, and uh, Bolton was an engineer, but he was also a person who understood the market. So what he said was, you know, let's not think about this as a water pump. Why was this being made, by the way? Why was there so many uh, engines being made? Because this was in the region where there were mines. They were digging, going deeper. And as they went deeper, water entered the mines. They needed a pump to pump out the water. So the Savary engine, the Newcomen engine, they were all pumps. And it was Bolton who said, with your efficiencies, you can make anything which needs to move, move. So let's do that. And that's how automation happened. That's how industrial age uh, came about. So you can make a shirt. You can make it for yourself. Now you can make it for the world. Because you can automate. So that is the industrial age. It goes back to the sciences of Newton, the loss of mechanics. So between Newton's loss, right, it was in the 1600s, late 1600s, that he formulated them, to the Watt engine, there was a good 100 years. So between science and the science entering into technology and the technology enter into the, entering into the market, there is a time. And that time is compressing, but there is. So that actually gives you an indication of how you can capture trends early and ride the wave so that you benefit uh, from those. Similarly, Edison invented the light bulb. Yes? No. Come on, I gave you a clue last time. So he made improvements to the light bulbs. His patent is about improving the light bulb filament, in fact. Right? But he did something. He said that I will make, if you have a light bulb, so what? There's no electricity at home. There's no electricity in a factory. So what do you do with the light bulb? 
right? So he said, I will do a centralized generation, transmission, and distribution of electricity, and that allowed electrification. But that was not enough again. Morgan was the person who said that, you know, Edison, you're a smart guy. You also understand the market, but uh, you need to uh, give it up at this point of time to a much larger cause, which is electrifying Northern America. So he engineered the merger of the Edison Electric Company and the Thomson Electric Company to form the General Electric Company. And that was the company which electrified Northern America. And the leadership of the newly formed company was not from Edison Electric Company. It was from Thomson Electric uh, Company. So it requires different skills at different stages. By the way, even this goes back to, back to Maxwell's equation. Right? I wish I will have the time to share the story of Maxwell sometime, but not today. And similarly, Shockley invented the semiconductor transistor. Ah, now you get the trick. He invented the sandwich junction transistor, but his colleagues invented the point junction transistor. He said that um, Shockley was so mad with his colleagues for keeping him out of the whole thing that he went and locked himself into a room and it took him all of two weeks in a hotel room to come up with the Nobel Prize winning point junction transistor. But luckily all three of them, him and his two colleagues, Baden and Breton, all of them got the Nobel Prize for it. But if not for Morita from Sony Corporation taking that semiconductor transistor and putting it into a, a commercial a tra radio transistor, bringing it back to the US where rock and roll was uh, uh, catching on uh, and making it a market fad, it would not have caught on. The cost of the transistor were too high. And all of this goes back to the science of Einstein and his photoelectric effect, which is what he got his Nobel Prize for, not the uh, theory of relativity, right? So this is how the age we are in has been created. These are the places where even today the inventions are happening. They might be getting miniaturized, but they're exactly the same uh, areas that uh, uh, the innovations are happening. So by understanding how it happened in the past, we can create the future. So that is my submission. And as individuals, how do we go about doing it? It's fine to understand all this, but what do we do as individuals? And you heard many thoughts today, and this is my way of looking at it. There are actions and there are mindsets. Now the critical finding I had as I worked with my teams um, in producing patents, in producing intellectual property, in putting products out into the market which were generating $250 million in India, $1 billion worldwide. This is from a team in Bangalore. What I found was that the actions and the mindsets are uniquely associated. So create with a mindset of freedom. When you're creating, don't worry if the boss is going to approve it or whether you will get a particular rating at the end of the year. No, that's not the time for it. You create like a child. There is no expectation, right? You create and move on. That is, that's how the child is. But you have to grow up. You cannot be a child all the time. That's where you move to the phase of nurture, but this is with a different mindset. Sometimes it's a different person, but it usually doesn't happen like that. It is your idea. You have to take it further. By the way, your idea is 1% of the journey. 99% is yet to come. That's why startups are exciting, right? But it requires another 99% after you start up. So that's where you have to nurture with passion of a maniac. The reason maniac is because if you're not maniacal about your idea, like that Majnu, you know, who is in love, if you're not maniacal like that, your idea will get trampled upon. The better your idea is, the quicker it will get trampled upon. So it is your job to take that idea and nurture it through the tough days till it sees the light of the day. And when you're most successful with your idea, when you're most successful, it's most difficult. You have to change and change with the detachment, detachment of a warrior. When you go into the battlefield, you're detached, right? So that is the way you go and change. Otherwise, you'll be the Sony Walkman uh, and you'll be taken over by many other products. Now, so with that knowledge, how do I anticipate the next? How am I going to take my team to think about where we will invest our time and money and effort? This is a map which I have created, but equivalent maps can be created by each one of you. And it's based on the same principle. What are the emerging sciences? What is it that the people are using their minds for and developing? What are the emerging materials? What are the new discoveries in the materials? But what are the markets that they will serve today? What are the markets that they will serve tomorrow? Can we anticipate those? And that's how we create the future. I'll give you just one example because this is a huge map and we are not going to spend all the time talking about this. Genomics, and I'll again tell you a story. This is a story of a colleague of mine. He was 
you know, we knew something was wrong because he was taking a lot of time off. And then finally we figured out that he had cancer and uh, he had seemingly dealt with it. So I asked him, I made the effort to ask him, what happened, could you share? And he said, yeah, you know, I went to my father's funeral sometime back, several years back, and uh, my mom was talking about his symptoms. And I realized that his symptoms were in early stages similar to what I was going through. So when I came back home, I went to the doctor and said, doctor, please check me up because my dad just passed away and I have the same symptoms. And the doctor said that it's very typical that your dad just passed away and you're going to uh, be depressed and you're going to have all these morbid thoughts. And, um, but since you asked, I cannot refuse, we will test it. Unfortunately, the test came out positive. He had cancer. And uh, he, went, uh, he started going treatment, undergoing treatment. Luckily, they found it early enough. But unluckily, the treatment did not work. The traditional treatments of all kinds did not work. And then he was an engineer. He's my colleague. Uh, he's a very data-oriented guy. He calculated how much time he had based on the symptoms he had and correlating it back to his father's symptoms. right? And he said, I don't have much time. So he went for an experimental therapy where they took his brother's dendritic cells and the attempt was to reprogram his blood. And they tried it, they tried it, it did not work. And my colleague said, I have two more weeks to go. My next doctor's visit is a month later. I'm not going to make it for that. But then suddenly he started feeling better and better. He made it to his doctor's visit and they said, cancer is gone. Right? The experimental therapy kicked in. How did they do it? You know, we all have cancer cells. Our body knows how to get rid of them. When our body loses the ability to get rid of them, that is when you have cancer. So they reprogrammed his blood to be that of his brothers. But now he has a problem. The body thinks that the blood is probably not his or the skin is probably not his. So, but it has rejected the skin. So he, but it's not a major problem. He cannot sit in white light. If he sits in white light, the skin starts uh, peeling off. But it's a better problem to have than dying, right? So there are many innovation methods each company uses. The key thing I want you to take away from this slide is that what you will do in your companies will depend on the culture of your company. You know, knowing your end customer is best learned from a company like PNG. Knowing business and market priorities from Intel. Finding and articulating your passion. Steve Jobs, Apple. Developing the voice of the future, Facebook. Set uh, aggressive goals, Microsoft. Map goals to action and focus on actions, GE. Communicate, 3M. Work as a team is from the East, Toyota. Fail early and iterate uh, to success. This is from the pharma industry like Merck. Celebrate and small and big wins, Southwest Airlines. Build and leverage trust, Tata group of companies. Right? So I want, to, I want to end with uh, this slide. All I'll say is that the opportunity is here. The markets are here. And if we don't make it, somebody else will. $500 billion potential in the energy market. If we don't make those gas turbines, if we don't make those castings and forgings here, somebody else will. So it is our time. We will do it. And what we, how we do it is by smashing the hand-mind-market barrier. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.